she was um, able to help me with this and that you all were able to be here with us. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't want to make a big speech or anything. R writing this book was, it's a lot different than writing my other books. My other books are about, they're about metaphysical topics that I teach all the time and it's not a, it's just a part of who I am and it's not um, something that's um, hard to write about. This book was a little harder because it's fiction and it's a, uh, it's a story that's sort of near and dear to my heart. Anybody who knows me knows that I love Arthurian legend and have for a long, long time. <laughs> and um, so it was fun to write a story set in, in the Arthurian world. Um, this story is about, pretty much it's about, it's a love story. Um, it's about someone who falls in love at a very young age. And I think I know a little bit about that. <laughs> um, and um, it's also about um, the sacrifices and things that we have to make in um, a relationship and trying to figure out how, um, what our priorities are in a relationship. So um, even though it's set in the fifth century Wales, <laughs> it still has uh, some, uh, some things that will resonate, hopefully, for other people in today's society, in today's world. Um, and it's got some action and adventure and sword fighting and dragons and things like that in it too. So, you know, that's kind of fun as well. Um, at least it is to me. Um, for those of you who have not read the book yet, I would like to point out, because the, all the characters have Welsh names, there is a glossary in the back. I discovered it. I know, right? In the, Kindle, in the Kindle version, of course, it's also in the back. Um, but, you know, everybody who's read it on Kindle is like, I don't know how to pronounce any of these names. There is a glossary <laughs> um, so that you can, you know, maybe get a taste of what the names are supposed to sound like. I'm going to be honest, you know, it's really, Welsh is a really, um, really complicated language. And it's very pretty if you hear people speak it. Um, but it's not easy to find actual translations of these names. They're all, often, they're all pronounced in different ways. So it was really hard to even find a, a specific way that these names would be pronounced. So um, I just want to point that out just so that you're not sitting there going, what is she writing? Um, <laughs> what does this mean? Um, and I always tell people, hey, if you make up what the name sounds like. I know for me, when I first read the um, Harry Potter books, mm -hmm. Hermione, I never knew how to pronounce Hermione. I thought it was Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> the first three books. And you know, honestly, that's why J.K. Rowling had um, the character in, I think it was the fourth book or the fifth book, somewhere in there, where Hermione met the, the guy from like the other country and he couldn't pronounce her name. And she had to keep telling him how to pronounce her name in the book. And she did that because a lot of readers didn't know how to pronounce Hermione's name. Um, so I like, you know, JK Rowling is pretty darn smart as far as I'm concerned. Um, I cannot find where I'm supposed to be reading tonight. Um, Hold on a second. Give me a minute. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Listen to me. I'm like a teacher. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask um, while I'm trying to find where I'm um, going to read from in this book? Because um, if you do, please feel free to ask. I'm sorry? What inspired you to write it? I know you're into the Arthurian times and stuff like that, but there has to be something. I know spirit got to you, but. Well, yes, that's true. Um, actually, it's very interesting. If you read old Welsh poetry, which don't we all, um, <laughs> if you read an old Welsh poem from like the fifth century called the Vita Merlini, which translates into the life of Merlin, um, in that poem, Merlin has a wife. Okay. And in most Arthurian legend that most people are familiar with, Merlin is, is usually a solitary figure who's a magician or a wizard or some kind of enchanter or you don't see him as a human being, usually. You see him as, you know, this sort of otherworldly figure. And so when I re I had read the Vita Merlini back in college, and when I reread it a few years ago, I started thinking about this idea of, well, who would this girl be? Who would this woman be that would be married to this person who eventually becomes Merlin, this great enchanter, this great whatever he is? Um, and what would she be like? And so... Um, that was sort of the impetus for writing this book okay. because it is told from this point of view, which is okay. the girl who falls in love with Merlin That's and good. the sacrifices that she has to make okay. um, as he becomes more and more important in the world. 
um, because she doesn't know that that's what's going to happen when she falls in love with him. Right. And so then she has to make all these sacrifices for their relationship um, that she might not have had to make. Okay. So, um, yeah, so read, read the Vita Merlini. And, you can, uh, <laughs> and you'll find all about Merlin and his, his wife, whose name in that poem actually is uh, Gwendolina. But I don't like that name, so I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wonderful thing about being an author. You can change what you want. Um, all right. I swear I know where this is in here. Um, in this passage that I'm going to read to set it up, um, Gundeth is... Um, She's a 16 year old, 16 years old. She lives in a in a um, a fortress basically with her grandfather. Um, her mother and father are both dead, and her grandfather is her um, protector. But her grandfather doesn't really pay any attention to her. He's given her care over to her foster parents, um, who are sort of the captain of his guard and the um, person who runs the household. And um, so she doesn't get a lot of attention from her grandfather, but. Um, of course, it's expected that she's going to marry somebody to sort of enforce his um, his position in society, her grandfather's position, and to sort of unite the, the tribes and things because the Welsh people were in tribes at that time, and um, they want to try and find a good match for her. And Of course, she hates the idea and doesn't want to do that, but she knows she doesn't really have a choice. So um, she meets Merlin in the, um, in the marketplace one day and falls sort of, you know, instantly infatuated with this guy um, who's very mysterious and cute and all of that good stuff. And um, as we often do, we see someone across the room and we go, well, he's kind of interesting. Maybe I should talk to him. Um, <laughs> that didn't happen, did it? No. <laughs> um, but anyway, she, she finds out then after she's met Merlin and after he starts to teach her um, some of his healing abilities. Um, she has natural healing abilities, and so he's teaching her um, more about that. Um, she finds out that her grandfather has betrothed her to um, some heathen guy that lives up in the north named Lot. And um, she's not thrilled about that, of course, but there's not a whole lot she really feels like she can do about it. Um, because at that time, that's pretty much what you did. You know, that was your lot in life. Pretty, your lot in life. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, was what you did in life. You went and married somebody, and, and that was pretty much it. Um, so in this passage that I'm going to read, she is um, has just found out from her grandfather that she's got this suitor coming. I found it. Yay. Yay. And <laughs> she has this suitor coming to meet her, and she has to... Um, behave herself and impress him and she's not happy so she goes to her lesson the next day with Merlin and his uh, teacher Blaze who was a druid and um, this, is, this is the scene that, that they have together it was nearly impossible to face Merlin the next day when I brought the meal to the druid quarters he tried to draw me out with jokes and questions but my short responses and melancholy looks eventually silenced him Blaze seemed oblivious to it all, and after eating a light meal, retired to the comfort of his private chamber. I walked to the drying table and took up the pestle, throwing a weed I couldn't recognize into the mortar and grinding it without thought. I felt Mervyn's eyes on me, his bewilderment palpable in the air, but I did not glare, dare glance his way. I feared collapsing into tears, or worse, confessing my undying love to his great embarrassment. He would know soon enough about Lot. But how could I hide my distress from him without telling him my true feelings? Tears stung my eyes as I pounded the herbs until a hand stayed mine. Good to stop. You'll shatter the poor mortar, and then what shall we do? His tone was light, and it made me angry. I tore my arm away and heaved the pestle across the room. It sprayed dried leaves in an arc across the table as it flew before striking the wall with a sharp ring. I cannot bear you making fun of me today, Mervyn. I was not making fun. I was trying to distract you from whatever poisons your thoughts. He reached to touch my shoulder, but I darted away, keeping my face askance. I knew if I looked into his eyes, I would lose any control I had. Come, what is it? I sighed. Sooner or later, he would hear anyway, and had I not told him the truth and all. My grandfather has found a husband for me. He comes now from Lothian to be here at Christmas time. I see. A long pause followed. Eternal moments later, I could bear it no longer. I whirled towards him, my anger stoked again. Is that all you can say? 
Merlin spread his hands in a gesture of acquiescence. What do you want me to say? You know how unhappy this makes me, how much I hate that I have no say in this, that I must instead be the dutiful granddaughter made into the obedient wife. How can you stand by and watch me suffer? Do you expect me to stop it? He cocked his head to one side, scowling. You are the only one who can control your life, Glendon. Have you learned nothing in these last months I've instructed you? But that's a lie, I shouted. It's a lie that I have control. Is that not what magic is, mastery over circumstance? How can I control my own life when I'm not even the mistress of it? He took a step toward me, his voice firm. Of course you have control. It's hard to see now, but there are things you can do. You always have a choice. You're wrong. I've been given no choice here, and it hurts more than you could possibly understand. I stalked to the door of the chamber and threw it open, trying to check the tremor of my hands so he would not see my weakness. I believe our lessons are at an end. He frowned. What do you mean? This doesn't mean to change. Yes, it does. The purpose of these lessons was to make me, a more, make me more attractive to a suitor. Now that grandfather has promised me to Lord Lot, there is no need for me to study further. I looked him in the eye, all my tears dried in the wake of my fury. I thank you, Lord Merlin, for your guidance. I know what I have learned will make me a better wife. I spit out the last word, spun on my heel, and dashed from his sight before he could protest. I headed straight for my chambers and did not emerge until the next morning, promising myself I would cry no more. I was empty inside. Oh. <laughs>